Welcome to Building My Legacy Podcast. This podcast is designed for leaders and entrepreneurs who want to leave a legacy and will provide strategies that focus upon key elements for legacy creation, determining your desired impact and its benefit, increasing your legacy's reach by engaging key stakeholders, planning, prioritizing, and executing. Here's your host, Dr. Lois Sonstegard. Welcome, everybody, to today's Building My Legacy podcast. I have with me Christopher O'Donnell. He is just fascinating because he's Senior Vice President of Product for HubSpot. He is an innovator. He is a speaker. He is uh, does a lot of work with MIT in talking about team and culture development. He is also very interesting because he's strong in music and continues to follow that passion that he has as he continues to also develop uh, his business. So he has taken um, HubSpot product from startup, which was a $50 million company in revenue, and had it publicly traded to about $600 million in revenue. So he is a man who has a great deal of experience building, growing, innovating and developing. So with that, Christopher, we'll get started. And if you want to add anything that I missed of what you think is really important about who you are, please share it. And then we'll get into our discussion. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me, Lois. I've, I've really looked forward to this and uh, just excited to see where the conversation takes us. Uh, what, what a time for us to be engaged in conversation about legacy and, and team building. It's, uh, it's something I'm very passionate about. So Christopher, you talk a lot about team building and culture. Let's start with team building in times of tremendous uncertainty. We have right now what I call the blended workplace. You have people working at home and in um, the, the workplace. We're going to have people shifting back and forth, trading, some working at home for a period of time and then trading places. So different days of the week being in different places. Uh, or we just assign people to certain spots. So mm -hmm. given what you know about team building, how do we navigate this new world of what we're going to experience? Well, I mean, what a timely topic. Uh, as we sit here having this conversation, it's what, it's early June. We're in the first week of June here. <clears throat> the world is um, has never been, you know, uh, or perhaps it has, but you know, certainly in, in my lifetime, the world has never been a more complicated uh, and challenging place. You know, vis-a-vis -vis how to wake up and make a contribution. Um, I, it's becoming foggier. I think you know there was the the pandemic, obviously threw threw us a lot of curveballs, and with you know the heightened race relations uh, conflict right now, I, we're really sp hitting pause to wrap our heads around. Um, around these challenges intellectually and emotionally and also put our arms around each other, you know, to try to figure out how we, how we say something and do something while also um, executing on our mission, which, you know, in, in, in our case, I think is a very meaningful one in terms of giving people economic freedom and, and giving them the tools to really build careers and so forth. And, and we don't want to lose that. So that balance is not something <laughs> I think that's very mature for us, you know, if I'm totally honest. Um, I think the part that's more mature for us is the the aspect of what you mentioned around this blended workplace. That for us is maturing quickly. You know, we have eight physical offices around the globe. And <clears throat> as we launched our ninth office in 2019, the location of that ninth office was remote. And uh, you know, we doubled down before COVID, we we doubled down on remote hiring. Um, perhaps people transitioning from in office to remote. And many of us, I have to say, have gone and obviously with COVID, you know, we've gone entirely in the direction of, of full time remote. Yeah. But this idea of hybrid, you know, this idea exactly of, of I love that word blended. Um, I found myself starting to split my days before COVID and, you know, trying to be smart about my energy levels throughout the day, trying to be smart about my commute. You know, I mean, on one hand, the idea that we all need to 
live in suburbs and get in our cars at the same time in the morning, sit in traffic for an hour and 20 minutes at the same time so that we can sit at desks for the same hours and then, you know, do the whole thing in reverse is um, in a lot of industries, it's a little silly, you know, it's, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, we, we all need to, uh, to rush in and pack like sardines. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not necessary. And, uh, and COVID, you know, I hate to say that there are blessings here, but I, I think we can take from it um, the positive of investing in making that work. You know, here we are on, on Zoom talking to each other, and this is much more natural than it would have been. And, you know, everybody in my life is now used to, to doing this. Um, as a musician, I can take lessons with you know, 10 times as many teachers because people are more open to that format. And so in a sense, the world has kind of opened up in all of these different dimensions, which is, which is really interesting. So many different community strands have moved online. And I suspect a large part of that will stay forever. You know, I noticed that uh, it's not necessarily that employees, you know, pandemic aside, it's not that employees these days are full-time remote, or full-time in office, though certainly either of those are, are kind of possible. But, you know, if I'm meeting with, in the office, with the three or four people who sit physically next to me in the conference room that is physically next to where we sit, I notice that one of those people will be on Zoom. You know, one of those people will be video conferencing because life happens. And I think that's a huge part of modern leadership is embracing that life happens um, you know, the days of having to file PTO so that you can go to the dentist or um, having to explain to people because your kid is, <laughs> you know, uh, throwing up first thing in the morning or something like that, that's very quickly going away. You know, uh, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's not necessarily even a, an aspect of altruism or employee culture and retention. It's really it just doesn't make sense from from a capitalist perspective to be nickeling and diming people on on every minute of the day when what you want and what drives the company forward and yes what helps retain great employees is those people feeling like they can do their best work when they're ready to do it you know capturing the imagination of creative people um, getting them motivated to execute on a mission and so much of our work is done in the shower or walking the dog or, you know, while we're sleeping, you know, and of course the collaboration and the heads down time reading and writing is, is, is still a massive part of any, you know, quote unquote information job. Um, but the world has just absolutely changed. I think COVID has accelerated that change and I see uh, a, a massive new normal where wide swaths of certainly our country and, and beyond our borders will be partially remote or distributed uh, forever. You know, I, I hear from women in middle management in particular, hmm. like, well, I used to be on the road Monday through Friday for my company. I don't want to do that again. I'm finally home for the first time. My kids are now teenagers and I'm getting to know them, right? So you're right. Those are some of the positive. But I think coming back into work now, people are going to come back with some different attitudes and mm. wants. So, you know, before it was, I need a paycheck. I got to go home and support my family. Now they've seen I can do a paycheck. I can be productive and I can take care of my family. So let me do that. Right. And I think there's going to be some very different discussions. But tell me. With what you've done and how you've worked with your eight offices and your remote office, how do you develop and build teams? Yeah, wow. Um, <laughs> how do we develop and build teams? The, the beginning, I mean, you can, just as we think about a customer life cycle in, say, sales and marketing and, and you know, sort of that front office side of the business, we focus on the employee life cycle. And, and there is an entire arc to that. And you can take every phase of that um, exp human experience of being part of the team and the mission and give yourself an honest grade on how you're doing and give yourself a grade on, you know, your ability to attract the best people, your ability to retain them. And while they're on this mission, hopefully for a long time, 
um, are they growing, are they developing, and are they doing their best work? You know, so following that, if, you know, if one were to sort of buy into that lens, it starts with recruiting. Uh, I spend an enormous amount of my time recruiting at all levels. You know, from associate product manager, it's somebody's first or second job out of college, you know, kind of thing, all the way up to, you know, the vice president, senior vice president level. Um, you know, it's it's so critical. And every conversation that you have in, in some ways is a career development conversation for you and for the port person that you're, you know, interacting with. We're all sharing information, we're learning. Um, and that ends up being the best conduit to build the team. You know, I love when people materialize. It's not as though, I, I love that word. It's like, I see somebody in the halls and they, they have materialized on the team at HubSpot. Um, but we've had a relationship. You what know, what does years. that mean to you when you say they materialized on the team at HubSpot? They, they've, 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 they have been on our radar you know, and they have relationships with multiple people within our walls and the day has come for them to join the team, okay. you know? And so it's, it, I guess, suppose what I'm illustrating is it's not a, uh, it's not just a funnel. It's not transactional where you say, you know, here's a job posting um, and we are going to allow people to apply for it and pick one of those people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a part of it. But how do you do that in a really wide um, broad slate kind of way that is ongoing and that is really engaged and where we can be involved in developing people's careers even before they work here, you know? Um, and we can find, this is, by the way, a massively important motion and, and sort of uh, uh, perspective toward recruiting for diversity and inclusivity. You know, we want people with different work behavior. We want people from different backgrounds. We want people who have different skills that they bring to the table. And, you know, you may not have the right role for somebody based on their personality and their interests and their skills. Um, if you keep that relationship going, you might in six months. And so it's a very long-term approach. I look at my direct reports. And a lot of those folks, you know, I knew for two or two or more years before they came in and joined the team. And so that's what it means to me to, to sort of materialize in our halls is uh, to have already been part of, you know, our universe and then, you know, to teleport into this mission at, uh, at the right time, you know, and the right part of the mission for that person for them to succeed. And, you know, I think that you, there's nothing you can do to build an effective team without getting that right. Uh, it's not enough to just do that, but it's absolutely the, you know, the, if you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs for team building, I mean, that's got to be at the bottom is getting the right people in a diverse mix of people who are going to push each other, trust each other, um, and, and grow in their mission, try different things, have a diversity of experience. And, uh, and then it's, you know, from a leadership perspective, it's, it's our, it's our game to lose at that point. You know, how do we create psychological safety and keep people sticking around and excited, engaged, and doing their best work. So here's something that's interesting with what you said. You see somebody in the halls, and you realize they have materialized, right? Now with Blended, the fear is, well, you notice me in the halls. There's no longer that hall. So how do people get noticed? I, I think that's a huge concern. I think it's a huge concern. Um, I'm personally, and I think that my team is from the data that we have relatively comfortable with a blended environment or a remote environment with that exception. Um, the bumping into each other at the water cooler aspect of work, the ad hoc conversations that pop up, the, yeah, the conversation, you know, on, on a couch, having a coffee that, you know, that was going to be an email that might not have been written for a week that turns into a much more colorful and productive conversation, you know, over that cup of coffee. Um, we have not figured out how to replicate that. Uh, we're trying a lot of different things. So that's, that's kind of what I would say about it is we're in the experimentation phase. Uh, our product management team had, for example, a, uh, a pub trivia night on zoom. You know? And, and that's something that we would have done, you know, in person clearly. And, uh, and, and we just decided to move it to zoom and try it. 
And then, you know, we, we get a lot of feedback from employees on what's working and not working. We're particularly, we're usually obsessive about it. We're even more obsessive about it in this world, given how little we know about that. But we worry about that. You know, we, we worry about losing the water cooler, losing the ad hoc conversations. Um, you know, for my part, I'm also experimenting with trying to find blocks of time. Uh, for instance, this, you know, my schedule is typically meetings top to bottom trying to find a block of time where I can be more ad hoc about it. So that if uh, there's a Slack conversation that can evolve into a Zoom conversation very easily. And I noticed there's, there's some promise to that where it's, it can be easier in some ways to get face to face when we're all sitting in front of, you know, some sort of portal here where we can magically beam uh, into a conversation. Um, but that's based on availability. So I think everybody's trying to figure it out. Um, and I think you, if you ask me, you totally nailed that, you know, the, the, the plot hole with all of this, um, that, that really, I don't think anybody's figured out yet. Well, I, I think there's two sides to it, Christopher, from how I see it. One mm -hmm. is I hear, as I work with companies, people making the comment, um, you know, what anger sometimes over teammates who just are concerned about pushing themselves forward and being politically noticed within the company, mm. sacrificing some key team people. So those people look at what's happening and go, this is great. I get equal time and I get heard more. People who have, have succeeded by leveraging themselves specifically um, are probably the ones who get hurt more but they may also be good. So, you know, you, it, it's easy to have a judgment about how people operate without having the data you don't know, right? So there's, there's several parts to that that really have to be thought through. That, that's such a good point. Wow. Um, it can level the playing field dramatically, I think. It, it's such a good point. I mean, my own work has shifted to be so much more focused on the written word. Um, the entire creative workflow of ideas has shifted and become, for me, more transparent and more, probably more collaborative because it's, it has to live in documents. It has to live in the written word, um, which provides an opportunity for much more information symmetry because it's, it's easier to take a document and invite people in or right. publish it on, on our wiki or, you know, sort of it, it broaden, you know, the, the tent, so to speak, of who's involved in, in that debate or that discussion much easier than if it's in a leader's head, you know, and they're, and they're sort of bouncing around their normal orbit, having their normal conversations. And I think that's a, a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing. You know, I worry from an inclusivity perspective, absolutely. Um, about what you say, you know, that the, the squeaky wheel gets the, gets the grease and people who are very good public speakers or people who are funny or people who have, you know, some of these particular um, traits uh, with which there's nothing wrong, you know, and, and there can be a benefit to those things, but they do overshadow unfairly some of the more thoughtful and quieter communication styles. And, and I think in this, um, in this world of everybody being remote, the written word has become the lifeline for everybody and has the potential absolutely to, to really level the playing field. I think it's a great thing. And I think the performance, by the way, no surprise, the ideas are better. Um, the conversation is deeper. More people are involved in the conversation and it's crisper. So you know what's interesting about that? If you're relying on the written word more, do you realize what you have just done to diversity and inclusion? You've eliminated it as a problem because written word has no race in it. It has no gender in it. It has simply the word and your ability to communicate, right? And so it's a, it's a, at this time with what we're struggling with, I find that I, I had never thought of that. That, that is fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're, I've been experimenting with all kinds of different little frameworks for getting ideas and for starting conversations and for identifying what part of a difficult topic we should spend our in-person time on. And in all of these experiments, one of the things I've started to do is to, uh, 
to take people's names off their work. You know, hey, here's an exercise. Here's here's you know here's an exercise for this new product we're doing, and we and we need to figure out the story we want to tell about it. So um, let's try to each tell a story about this in our own authentic way, and we're going to put them in a folder, you know, on a hard drive somewhere in the cloud, and none of us are going to know, you know, it's like how teachers grade tests, you know, and you take everybody's names off it. And I think there's something kind of magical to that, you know, when you do that, because all of a sudden you, people are more willing to try quote unquote stupid things, which we all know with innovation, that's where the great stuff comes from. It's like, Hey, I might be crazy, but, and it's easier to say I might be crazy, but if you're, if there's no, I, you know, Hey, here's just an idea. Maybe I want to do this exercise. Maybe I want to do three of them and just throw them out there. And it starts to change. This is like a huge culture change that I would love to see across the board. And I would love to live through in, in my own career selfishly is just to move away from pride of authorship and to move away from anything, any, any fruit of that poisonous tree around you know, uh, jockeying, right? To your earlier point about, you know, people care about their careers and people care about credit and they, and they care about looking good. And there's some reality to that in the workplace of why it makes sense. Um, but there's the old saying, you know, anything is possible if it doesn't matter who gets the credit. Uh, and so taking people's names off the work and sort of centralizing it has been an interesting experiment. So with that, Christopher, you rely a great deal on innovation to keep your pro your company moving and growing. You've grown very rapidly, you've done very, very well. How do you innovate? How do you innovate with a blended company? How do you innovate? Well, you know, if you want really great stuff, you need to have some mechanism for tolerating failure. You know, I, I think that's a first principle. I would, I would argue that is just a truth, a law of physics. Um, if you want something that is safe and predictable, it will revert to the mean or probably below the mean, you know? Well, so, right so then the question, Madison, aren't you? What's that? You're right there with Edison. Yes. I mean, yes. I mean, yeah. And, you know, I mean, truth be told, he stole a lot of people's ideas, uh, you know, but, but, but the failure, the failure aspect of it is, um, is, is absolutely critical. And so we can sort of transform the conversation around innovation to one around failure tolerance and uh, iteration. So we can kind of build this up for first principles. If we, if we want an innovative culture, we need one that tolerates fa uh, failure. Um, and to tolerate failure, we need what? Well, we need psychological safety. We need protection. We need trust. Mm -hmm. And these things sound very, they sound very fluffy until you have that moment where you can put your finger on it and point it out. And so that's the, the thing in leadership that we try to do because we can't put a team together and say, hey, trust each other. Right. We can't do that. No, no one can manufacture that trust. All we can do in leadership is, you know, we can try to give them a, a, a mission and not tell them how to execute on the mission, but give them guardrails. Hey, here are the rules of the game, but you got to go play the game and you own the result. You know, that's, that's something that, you know, in this sort of modern leadership uh, zeitgeist has, has been around for, for a while now, it's hard to implement, you know, and, and why is it hard to implement? Well, because in leadership, we have to actually let teams try things that don't work. and we have to cover for them when they fail in, in an authentic and transparent way. That means as leaders, we take the blame. And when they succeed, we need to give them the credit um, and also point out to them that they succeeded. And there's nothing so small that it's not worth pointing out to the team. Look at what you did. Look at what you did. And it's almost like a, it's almost like a Montessori pedagogy where you, you know, you celebrate the child and you, and it's not about telling the child that they did a good job, but it's intrinsic motivation and sort of saying, how do you feel about this art that you made? Could you have done that last week? Well, no, I couldn't have done that last week. Isn't that interesting? And then the teams start to, to, to kind of gel and bond. Um, and when that bond is formed and when the skills are mature uh, and when the mission is clear, we just have to get out of the way. 
So when you talk about having a level of failure that you're going to accept, you're a publicly traded company. How do you balance that push from your, you know, looking at what happens with your shareholders and how they view what you're doing and that tolerance for innovation is going to come with some failure. I've got to allow it. Where do you find that balance for you as the leader? Because your safety net also is necessary, right, for you to create that culture. It, it, and that's really the, the ball game there, you know. Um, guardrails, you know, guardrails. And that's a huge investment for us in leadership. Um, and, and you're right, at the stakes that we're playing, there are many guardrails around security and, you know, reliability. You, th these are non-negotiable things. We can't fail at aspects of what we do. And we need to have extremely rigorous uh, discipline and process and, and, and levels of quality around those sort of, again, using Maslow's hierarchy, you know, sort of if there were a hierarchy for, um, for, for these types of products, you know, the bottom part of that hierarchy is non-negotiable. And then as you start to move up that hierarchy, uh, it becomes more negotiable. You know, is this, is this new design going to work? You know, um, well, maybe don't release it to, to all of your customers at once. Oh, okay. Interesting. And so you can encapsulate the impact of, uh, you know, experimentation and have, uh, have that be very controllable and very small. And then from there, think about how do you use those small environments to learn as much as possible. So for, for us, you know, when we fail, ideally we're failing with, you know, five customers only, not 80,000 customers, but we fail with five customers. And those are customers who have product managers' cell phones on speed dial. You know, I mean, it, some of our customers, when we get invited to their weddings, you know, it, it's the, the relationship is, is that tight. And so it's not just trusting each other. It's trusting our customers and our customers trusting us. But the key thing there is to have it be very, very small and very, you know, encapsulated in terms of the level of that risk so that you can roll it back, so that you can iterate, so that you can kind of pivot around. And then ultimately, when we come forward with a new product and we talk to Wall Street about it, for example, you know, you mentioned the publicly traded company. Those are things that are not, you know, in the old world of software, you know, where you would ship a bunch of CD-ROMs out to millions of people and you have one shot at it. Um, we're shipping a much higher quality product than that because we've been able to iterate and move quickly. You know, in the world of CD-ROM software, where you're you're shipping box software out every couple of years, which is when when my career started, that's what I worked on. You know, I worked on Windows EXE, C++ binaries that you know. And today, in our world of cloud software, we ship improvements to customers a thousand times a workday. A thousand times what? A day. A day. Wow. Wow. And so that's how small the little experiments can be. And we don't ship a thousand changes and improvements to every customer at every moment. But we are able to, uh, it's like pick up the candy wrapper. You know, when, when you're in the office and you see somebody walk by a candy wrapper and it's not their candy wrapper and they don't, they don't pick it up and throw it away. You know, having, having that agility allows everybody to stop along the way and fix things when they see that there's a problem. I mean, we're, we still can fix a customer issue while we're on the phone with them today, you know, with 700 people in R&D or, what, you know, however many we are, 600 people in R&D. Um, I, I actually, I think it's over 700. Uh, we're still able to do that. So you've been able to grow and retain flexibility, which is so you've, you've grown, but you've kept that small mentality of how do we navigate quickly? And um, I think that is a key that we're all going to be challenged with moving forward. There's something, our time has gone just so fast. I have a lot of things I'd yet love to talk with you about. And I know our audience would love to hear about. I want to hear a little bit about your music and how 
that has been an integral part in your development and what you do as a leader and how you build teams. Yeah, well, you know, I have a funny background. I actually did my undergrad degree in, it was a combination of technology and music. And uh, when I graduated, there was no obvious way <laughs> to apply that to my life for gainful employment. Um, and I'm very lucky that, you know, some years later uh, at this point, those are the two um, in terms of my creative pursuits, you know, outside family, which is, which is number one for me always. But in the rest of my life, those are the two pillars. And there's so much in common, Lois. There's, there's so, so much in common. Uh, I, I think it comes down to the saying in music that, you know, if you're the best player in the band, you got to join a new band. Oh, okay. You know, and for me in technology, in music, whatever it is, I've never been the smartest person, the best person, the best player, the best writer, the best coder, the best designer. Um, by a long shot, you know, in whatever room I'm in, I, with music, you know, since high school or even before high school, I gravitated to, to the most talented people in the schools where I was. And I just sat and, and I sat with them and I watched them work. And I, I pointed out when, when they had great ideas and asked them questions about what they were doing and asked if they wanted to, to roll tape. And asked if they wanted to do overdubs over what they just recorded, you know, and and that's it's the same job, it's the same job, and so I'm lucky that on the music side uh, with the band The Providers, uh, which people can check out at theproviders.com, you know, this is a band where I do write the music, play guitar, sing sing the songs, and uh, and then we pull in the absolute best session players around Boston and the surrounding area. And it's a delight. Yeah, I got to tell you, it's the most fun thing in the world because I just get to be in the room with people who musically are so light years beyond me um, and give you know me delight and new ideas uh, and so forth. And work is the same way. Work is the same way. And we're talking about this leadership stuff. We're talking about ownership. It's exactly the same thing. You know, you don't hire the best drummer in town to come in to record and you tell them every note to play. Right. You know, why would you, do, why bother? Why bother? Mm -hmm. uh, do it yourself. You bring someone in and you let that person fall in love with the song. And you let that person try three or four or five or 10 different approaches to it. And when they feel really proud of it, that's when you stop. And in and, and technology, anything else in business, it's exactly the same way. Yeah, I don't want to be the best person in the band. I don't want to be the best designer or coder or product person uh, on the team at all. I want to be a magnet uh, so that the really amazing people think, geez, if I go there, I'm going to be able to do my best work. And I want my team to support those people in doing their best work um, because th th that's, it's the greatest thing. You know, it, engineers come up with better product ideas than product managers. The product managers are there to tell the story and to lay the groundwork and to, and to help the engineers, just like helping the session players fall in love with the song, help the engineers fall in love with the mission, fall in love with the problem, and let them sleep on it. Let them try things. And then they will come back with solutions that we would have never dreamed of. And that's the, the most exciting thing for me creatively. What a note to end on. You know, I, I think that enthusiasm, that excitement of empowering people, which is what you're really talking about, letting people be their best and um, draw that out of them. You don't need to be the best if you're surrounded by the best because they'll just make you better anyway, right? So Christopher, it has been absolutely wonderful to have you on our podcast today. Thank you so much for being with us. And for those of you who are listening to us today, thank you so much for being with us on Building My Legacy podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Lois. You You've been listening to Building My Legacy podcast with Dr. Lois Sonstegard. To book your appointment with Dr. Sonstegard, visit www.buildtomorrow.com.